This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Satan is not who you think he is. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is going to be an interesting interview for me, and I hope for you as well, as we dig deep into not just the the Word of God, but uh, ancient texts that uh, help shed light on some of the more difficult to understand aspects of uh, the Bible, things that uh, to us may seem unusual, strange, or incomprehensible from a 21st century worldview. Joining us is the author of a brand new book. He is the pastor of The Way Congregation in Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, You'll find him online at thewaycongregation.com, where he streams his uh, services live every Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time. That's uh, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, He's got an M.A. in the Bible and its world from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a Ph.D. in Biblical Studies from Louisiana Baptist University. His new book is Corrupting the Image 2, Hybrids, Hades, and the Mount Hermon Connection. We are honored to welcome back to the bunker Dr. Douglas Hamp. Doug, it's good to talk with you again, brother. Thank you for having me, Derek. It is really a pleasure to be here. This book is really timely in in a way and also fascinating. Uh, Fascinating. I love books that really get me thinking. Uh, And uh, your new book does that uh, timely in that it dovetails with research that uh, I've been doing and also our friend uh, Dr. Judd Burton has been doing. Uh, we're, we're all triangulating on the same thing here, I think, and we're finding mm-hmm. that archaeology and that archaeologists, secular archaeologists and epigraphers, guys who study these old texts, are finding pieces of the puzzle without really understanding what they're seeing because they're not looking at it through a biblical worldview. So I'm glad for your new book because you put these pieces together in a new way. There's some great new discoveries in here, and I think things that will help people understand we're in the middle of a supernatural war that is far bigger than we imagine. Well said. Um, Yeah, we are definitely in the midst of the war. And, you know, the war has been going on literally since uh, the fall of Adam. And, uh, you know, Satan's not going down without a fight. I, you know, sometimes I hear that, you know, when Jesus returns, Satan's just going to throw up his hands. Okay, I lost. Like, no, he's going to go down until he, you know, he's going to go down clawing and fighting and screaming to the very last second. And uh, he has a plan to win. And I think we should be careful not to underestimate him. Mm. Uh, he's, you know, pretty sure of himself that he's got a, a winning strategy. And what I find very exciting is that certainly the Bible has revealed a lot of these things. But now, as you said, we are discovering a lot of these clues in the ancient world. We're discovering them in, in the ancient texts. I mean, I think we are in such an incredible time where we've been blessed with people that have found uh, ancient texts in ancient Sumer, Akkad, etc. And then scholars have had enough time to go over them and to decipher them for us. And so now we have the incredible privilege of being able to pick up these things and saying, oh, look at this. Look how amazing this fits into this storyline. It really is incredible. Yeah. Well, let's dive right in. Um one of the most fascinating chapters of the Bible, in, in my view, is Isaiah chapter 14, which is the uh, the famous, How Thou Art Fallen, O Lucifer, Son of the Morning chapter. Um, there's evidence there that uh, now, with some of these ancient texts, that we're literally in like the first or second generation to have access to these, suggests that uh, the identity of Lucifer, Satan, is not who we thought it was. How do these texts change our perception, our understanding of the uh, of Satan? Well, you know, a friend of mine wrote a paper on the identity of uh, of Helel. Um, he wrote this some years ago, and it was one of those papers that, you know, I was like, oh, okay, I'll read this thing. And then I was, as I was putting it all together, I was like, wow, it really fits that the word in Hebrew for, quote unquote, Lucifer is Helel. And, you know, when you kind of first discover this as a, Hebrew language student, you're like, okay, I guess, you know, the translators knew what they were doing, right? And um, But this word is is a hapax legomena. That means that it, it's a word that appears once in Scripture. Hmm. And anytime you have a hapax legomena, it's really difficult to translate because you don't have context to be able to figure out what this means. So my, my friend Bill Gallagher, he, he put this together and he derived that Helel had come from Akkadian Elil, which came from the Sumerian 
Enlil. Ah, okay. And and once, you know, that was the key that, that opened the door for me. And once I saw that, I was like, oh, okay. And so then I started researching Enlil. And guess what? He's everywhere. Yeah. Right? If, if you look for Lucifer in the ancient literature, you're going to come up with the big fat zero. You know, it's a goose egg. There's nothing there. Nothing. But if you find Enlil, oh, my, he's everywhere. And uh, the literature is replete with who this guy is. And mm-hmm. he is, hands down, the most significant god in the ancient Sumerian and Akkadian pantheon. Um, you know, and, and what's so interesting is that there is a creator god. His name is An or Anu, mm-hmm. depending on the language. And yeah, he was there. He made everything. But, you know, he's not important in that pantheon, which is very, very interesting. And when you start digging down deeper, you see that Enlil claims to be the one that usurped the authority of Anu, Hmm. the creator god. You know, and you're like, wow. And then, you know, as I kept looking at, you know, what the name means, Enlil, according to many scholars, it means uh, Lord of the Wind or Lord Wind, which comports very well with the Prince of the Power of the Air. Uh, There's another uh, burgeoning theory that um, Enlil could be the uh, God of Gods or Lord of Lords. That's, I think, a very interesting possibility as well. Yeah. yeah. And and then I think you pointed out an article to me that – which I've now put in the book, that uh, Enlil and Elilim, which is the word for idols, mm, mm-hmm. is the same word. El- Elilim comes from e- from Elil, which is the Akkadian version of Enlil. Right. Isaiah uh, used that, and uh, it sort of entered the Hebrew lexicon as a word that just meant worthless idol, but Isaiah was apparently referring to Enlil and the other gods that uh, were... I don't know, his minions or, or colleagues. It, it really is incredible. And you know what's amazing is kind of looking at the end times when we get to uh, the Antichrist, the beast, you know, there's a, a reference in Zechariah chapter 11 talking about the worthless shepherd. Mm. The word there is Elil, all right? So ah. it, it's actually, the, sh- it's actually the, the, the pastor or the shepherd of Enlil that is being referred to. Right. So, you know, once we have this word and we understand the correct uh, application that it's really talking about Satan, then we have then it unlocks all these other kind of difficulties or mysteries in the Bible that we're like, "Ah, I'm not sure what to do with that one. But now with this missing piece, we're able to then go back through the Bible and say, oh, that's talking about Satan. That's talking about Satan. Mm -hmm. I mean, time and again. We see that it's talking about Satan. Well, the parallel passage then to Isaiah 14 is Ezekiel 28. You draw an interesting connection then to the reference to Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14 is, on the surface, a polemic against the king of Babylon, which is interesting because at the time Isaiah was writing, Babylon was not really a power. It was a a vassal state of Assyria. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Ezekiel 28, he... uh, the, the prophet there is writing a polemic against the, the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre. So how then do we interpret the rebel in Ezekiel 28? Fascinating. Um, you know, that was one of those things that I, I, you know, grew up hearing that that's talking about Satan. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's talking about Satan. But then, you know, you start reading some of the uh, scholarly literature and it's talking about, well, this isn't really Satan. This is talking about, you know, the king of Tyre. And you're like, hmm, okay, what to do with that? Well, as it turns out, the king of Tyre was actually a, an epithet or a title for Melkart. So, Melek Karat mm. is Phoenician. Melek is king, Karat is city. So, it's the king of the city that is the king of Tyre. All right, And the king of Tyre or Melek Karat, Melkart, was a – and this is where it gets a little bit – Challenging to kind of keep up with uh, the different epithets and aliases, but <laughs> but that's kind of what we have to do, right? So he was a dying and rising god, mm-hmm. and there was an inscription found in Malta, a bilingual inscription in Phoenician and in Greek. And so on the Greek side of the inscription, 
Melkart was known as Heracles. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so so Heracles or Hercules, right? He is, of course, the uh, the hero, right? Sure. He, every, yeah. Everybody knows that he's the hero. We've all seen movies and read books about Hercules and Heracles. Um, so what happens then is you, you take this idea back, and it actually takes us back to the one that the Bible refers to as the hero, which is Nimrod. All right. So okay, right, the, so mi- the I'm, mighty I'm hunter before the Lord. The okay, mm. as best I can. All right. Mm-hmm. So so Nimrod is the hero. It says that he began to be a gibor. Now mm-hmm. the word he in Hebrew uh, gibor means hero. In fact, David had some giborim. He had some mighty men or some heroic men. Right. But uh, we also know that the Nephilim were the heroes. They were the mighty men of old. And so when we start looking at that in the Greek text of Septuagint, we find that they just understood it, that he became a gigas. He became a hybrid. He became a giant, ah. if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then looking at the name Nimrod, you know, nobody's going to name their kid Nimrod. Now, I know today it means like an idiot, but that's, def- <laughs> that's not what it, it meant at all in the ancient world. Nimrod actually was let's rebel. So no parent's going to name their kid Let's Rebel. I mean, mm-hmm. even the mafia boss is not going to name his kid Let's Rebel. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> you want your kid to 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 mind you, right? Do what mm-hmm. I say, son. And um, so Nimrod is actually what I believe is a deliberate um, distortion of the name of this entity, this person who was going around, and his. Akkadian name was Nin Urta, the Lord of the Earth. Ah, and in Semitic languages, you just have to take the consonants. And so, Nin Urta, Lord of the Earth. If you then just take out the consonants, you have uh, N, M, R, and D essentially, and so you have Nimrod. And so then, in the Bible, it becomes Let's Rebel, the Rebel. But in mm-hmm. The um, ancient Semitic or ancient Mesopotamian literature, Nimrod, or excuse me, Ninurta, was the lord of the earth, and he was the hero. That was one of his primary epithets, is that he was the hero. He may have been related to or have been the same as Gilgamesh, who was the ancient hero. Uh, and all these ideas, all these, these uh, heroic stories that we hear about, they all stem from Nin Urta or Gilgamesh, and they were probably one and the same um, person or legend. And so all that to kind of get back to Melkart, all right? So so there was a um, kind of a merging between Enlil and Nin Urta, that, that Nin Urta was said to be the son of Enlil, and that all of the uh, characteristics – the powers, the authority that Enlil had, those were then transferred to Ninurta. And so when we start talking about Melkart in Ezekiel 28, we're really talking about Satan. Hmm. We, we see that. And mm-hmm. then, you know, God goes on to say that you were the anointed cherub, right? You were perfect in your ways and all these different things, you know, until iniquity was found in you. And so... What we're seeing then is a um, a manifestation, another manifestation of Satan in the ancient world. So there's there's no question uh, when you look at the ancient literature that Enlil and and Halel in Isaiah 14 are the same, and then you start tracing those and you see that Melkart, the king of Tyre, is the same guy, and in some very interesting way he seems to have merged. With this entity known as Nin Urta or Nimrod, hmm. and, the, and what is curious because the Bible says that Nimrod began to be right. He didn't right, start right. off as a giant, but he became something that that he wasn't initially. Yeah, that 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 is fascinating, and this tracks with research that I've been doing into Enlil because that's part of the work going into my forthcoming book. And finding that Enlil and Ninurta are both tied to the city of Nippur, which was the the, the site of the uh, the Mesopotamian divine council, uh, 
Enlil's temple, the Eker, or the mountain house, or house of the mountain, was where the gods would convene to decree the fates of the land for the coming year. It, it almost sounds as though this conflation of those two, or the merging of their their aspects or, or abilities or um, character is similar to what we see with the true nature of the true God, Yahweh, who had you know the, the second power in heaven, the, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, who was Yahweh but not Yahweh. Um, it, it, it almost sounds like the, this is a sort of trying to create a, a, a counterfeit version of that with uh, Enlil and uh, Ninurta. Absolutely. I, I think that it, it was definitely on Satan's radar. You know, I think we have to go back. I, I always like to go back, at least, to the Garden of Eden, where it all got messed up. And, um, you know, Satan had this prophecy of doom hanging over his head. God says that I will cause enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. You will strike his head. Or he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So, <clears throat> since the beginning, this was something that Satan uh, had over his head, that this is going to happen, right? And he doesn't know when or how God is going to do this. But, of course, again, he's not an idiot. He's going to take God very seriously mm-hmm. and know that he's dealing with a very formidable foe. And so, he's going to try to do everything he can to somehow overturn or invalidate that promise so that nobody will be stepping on his head. And I think he did that um, in a very bold way uh, with the Nephilim and you know all of all of that. Of course, we know that went down <laughs> down the drain uh, in the flood. And so then after the flood, he has to essentially reconvene like, okay, what's, you know, what do you do now, right? That whole Nephilim plan, that didn't work out. So I think then he he picks one person. And I would suggest that he even overshadows um, Nimrod at this point. So that he's now fusing his DNA with this person known as Nimrod. So mm-hmm. that Nimrod becomes a god. He becomes the hero. He becomes immortal. Right, he goes from being just a human to becoming something far greater. And there was an article that came out, I think it was in the UK Telegraph, came out in 2019, blew my mind. This this guy named Chris from Reno, Nevada uh, had, uh, I think, leukemia. And so he was a bone marrow recipient. Mm-hmm. Well, they were tracking his DNA to kind of see what was happening. And <clears throat> about three or four months after receiving the bone marrow transplant from a donor in Germany, they looked at his sperm, and his sperm was no longer his own. Oh. It was that of his donor. <laughs> oh, that is weird. That is that, weird. I know. It's crazy. I, I've, right? heard, so, I've heard of this happening. That could really mess you up if uh, somebody wants to do a DNA test to prove your identity. I mean, how, what right. happens then? You know, I know. Yeah, weird. Or. But but the crazy thing is, if he sired children, mm-hmm. if Chris were to have kids, they would not be his. Hmm. They would be his donors, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, that's kind of freaky. So you, you, we take that piece of information, and if Satan is over able to overshadow uh, in some way, and, you know, I, I think a lot of the... I don't want this to sound raw in the wrong way, but some of the miracles, I'm not saying all, but some of the miracles we now understand, right? I mean, we actually can have a woman who becomes pregnant and still remains a virgin. That mm-hmm. is possible. It's called artificial insemination, right? So mm-hmm. it's still pretty impressive, but, you know, it, it's not quite what it was. <laughs> and, you know, so I think we're, we're beginning to understand is the more we dig into genetics and CRISPR-Cas9, I mean, the world is changing quickly, and I think we're discovering some of the things that have been hidden for a very long time, and now they're coming out into the open. Hmm. So, so my basic theory is that uh, Satan in some way overshadowed, let's call it maybe possessed uh, Nimrod, but then th- through this prolonged possession or overshadowing, he was then able to impart his genetic information uh into and onto 
uh, Nimrod's DNA so that it literally changed just like Chris from Reno, Nevada, his DNA changed. Mm -hmm. So too uh, Nimrod's would have changed. And he went from being just a guy to being essentially Satan incarnate. And I think that was kind of the plan because, you know, Satan, uh, he's kind of at a, at a, at a disadvantage, right? That he's trying to change things in the physical realm, but he's kind of stuck on the other side of the veil. You know, there's only so much you can do when you're bodiless and you're just a spirit. You can influence, but it's hard to really, you know, change things around. And and I think that he used Nimrod in a way to gain a, a real <laughs> foothold, uh, a very literal foothold. And then, uh, so now he he was able to become the Lord of the Earth. Hmm. And you know what's interesting is when we look at the uh, the literature. Enlil gave all of his authority, which he had usurped or stolen from An, the creator. And so then he now has this. And, and, and how the ancient world describes it is that he had the Tablet of Destinies. And then he gave the Tablet of Destinies to Nin Urta. Last I checked, Satan is a bit selfish, doesn't like to share, kind of wants all the glory for himself. So how do we explain that he would give his authority, his power, his throne, and uh, his his, you know, his power, his throne, and his great authority to somebody else? And that's exactly what we see in Revelation: that the dragon is going to give the beast who was is not and uh, ascends out of the abyss. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He will give him his power, throne, and great authority. And my solution is that Satan takes over the person. He completely envelops him. He inhabits him, possesses him, um, changes his DNA so that now this person becomes essentially the avatar for Satan. So Nimrod, second king of Uruk after the flood, is known as the one who built the Tower of Babel. And you do some writing here about Babel. What was the purpose of um, Nimrod overshadowed by Satan, constructing the Tower of Babel. What was he trying to do? I think it was twofold. One, I think he was trying to create a, a portal uh, for the gods or, you know, fallen angels, demons, whatever you want to call them, uh, to come through. And two, I think he was establishing the woman that rides the beast. Mm. This is the, uh, the lure that... Um, that tempts mankind, that lures mankind to give up his God-given authority and freedom and to then serve Satan. So, so the, the Tower of Babel, um, which I'm, I'm strongly uh, convinced that it really was in the area of Babel, uh, modern-day Babylon, Babylon, uh, and of course there in Iraq, uh, incidentally, the word Iraq and Uruk are the same exact word. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we get to the Neo-Babylonian kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar, we see that he is actually restoring a tower. And his dad had been working on that as well, N- Nabonidus, mm-hmm. um, had been uh, had been working on this tower to restore it. They say that it had been built some 42 generations earlier, and it was suddenly abandoned. And so they're trying to, to rebuild this thing. So I would suggest that the Tower of Babel in in um, in uh, Akkadian Bab Ilu is the gate of the gods. Mm-hmm. And so they were trying to create some kind of a portal uh, in order to to bridge this gap. And uh, you mentioned already that the Akur is the the this mountain, this big mountain. Literally, is what it means, big mountain. And, um, you know, it talks about that the mountain is the connection point between heaven and earth. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, some kind of a, a stargate. There's lots of different terms for this. The temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. Uh, the temple of the wielder of the seven decrees of heaven and earth. Temple of the starway of pure heaven. <laughs> temple of the ziggurat exalted dwelling place. Temple of the Exalted Mountain, et cetera, et cetera. Not too grandiose. And, <laughs> yeah. 
you know, and, and what's, you know, when you think about it, God revealed to Jacob at Beit El that there was a ladder between heaven and earth. And then Jesus later tells us that he is the ladder between heaven and earth, that angels are going to ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. Right? Well, it's interesting that in the ancient world, Satan um, purported himself to be the ladder. Right? He was actually the connection point between these two places. And so, uh, as you m- mentioned, the city of Nippur was called the Duran Ki, the bond between heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. And Enlil uh, had the central position that he, it was literally, you know, the city of Enlil, bond of heaven and earth, Enlil, the great mountain. Mm-hmm. So Enlil, one of his major epithets is the great mountain, the Akur, and and that becomes a epithet for many other of his aliases as well. So he fancies himself to be the connection point between these two. And what I think what I think uh, he was trying to do is, is create uh, some kind of a, a wormhole or a portal to that other dimension behind the veil, behind and when I talk about the veil, I'm talking about some kind of a, a cosmic barrier between our domain, the earthly domain, and the heavenly spiritual domain. The Bible talks about that in, in several places. But he was trying to open this portal so that the gods could communicate freely. They could come down and then they could, um, you know, do their, their dirty business. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. And I, I agree uh, that the, the purpose of that uh, tower was to, was to open a portal. Uh, I think, also think it's fascinating that you've got, uh, not to rabbit trail too far, but uh, that you've got the Zechariah Sitchinites, the late Zechariah Sitchin, who mistranslated or just couldn't read Sumerian. The the transliteration of Nippur as Nibiru, which I, I guess some scholars uh, do translate Nippur as Nibiru, but took it as the planet of these ancient aliens who then landed on Earth, and uh, so we're just you know descended from these uh, cosmonauts from other worlds uh, instead of seeing it for what it is, which are these spirit beings who mm-hmm. gathered at this uh, this ancient city of uh, Ninurta and uh, Enlil. Um, the uh, the name mountain or the word mountain in Sumerian Kur. Um, can also mean underworld, which mm-hmm. is a fascinating has fascinating implications for understanding na- the nature of this entity. Um, another aspect of this, uh, and, and by the way, I note that there's a reference to Great Mountain in Zechariah four verse seven. Who are you, O Great Mountain? Before you, before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Yes, uh, which I, I yes. think is yeah. is God basically sending a message. To this it's not just a symbol for a uh-huh. really difficult job. Um, <laughs> That's right. Which is how Bible yeah. teachers generally take it. Yeah, but and 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 Jeremiah also talks about. God is going to destroy uh, the destroying mountain. Yeah. Right, which he identifies as, as Babel or Babylon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, it, it's, I tell you, they all, all roads lead back to Enlil. That's the mm-hmm. point here, you know? Oh, I agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. Um, so we've got this idea that he's uh, associated with a mountain. That was his epithet, oh, great mountain. We see that epithet applied to Dagon, who was uh, his identity among the Amorites who lived along the Euphrates River. But uh, if he's Satan, uh, we know that Satan is described as the red dragon with seven heads and ten crowns in Revelation 12. How do we connect Enlil and Ninurta with uh, dragons? (laughs) Great question. Um, And this might blow your mind, (laughs) because it (laughs) certainly blew my mind. Um, You know, in in my book, I have a whole chapter on, uh, on the dragon. Uh, because that was one of that was one of the questions that really kind of stumped me. I'm like, wait, why is Satan called a dragon, a red dragon for that in the book of Revelation? Mm-hmm. Well, lo and behold, as you, you might suspect by now, uh, one of Enlil's major epithets was the dragon. Hmm. Not only was it an epithet, but we have this in uh, color, right? We've got we have we have color reliefs of uh, Satan being the dragon. And th- there's essentially um, uh, some some basic names that we have. We have Ushumgalu. This is um, uh, a uh, Ushumgalu is a Sumerian, Ushumgalu, an Akkadian. And it means the great 
dragon. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, okay. So this Ushungal is represented in a few different ways, but the, the overwhelming majority of the ways it is presented is a hybridized creature, a chimera. It's uh, got a lion's head. It has wings. It has uh, eagle talons on its back feet. Um, and and then sometimes then as kind of as the the motif went on, it, it seemed to kind of grow, and then it eventually got a scorpion's tail. It spewed out um, it spewed out um, uh, venom, you know, some kind of toxic venom of some sort. And what's amazing, there's a there's a cylinder seal from about 2300 BC where that creature, the, it's called the Anzu bird, mm-hmm. is going along. It it really stands for Satan himself, for Enlil himself. That's pointed out by uh, uh, Vigner or Vigger, Um He he says that really this Anzu bird, though it's often associated with Ninurta, it's actually Enlil. Okay. Oh. Like, oh. Okay. That's interesting. And so this this cylinder seal has Ishtar on the back of this creature, right? She's the woman riding the beast. Yes, yes. And you know, and who does she represent? Well, Ishtar is Akkadian for Inanna. Inanna mm-hmm. is Sumerian. Uh Inanna literally means the queen of heaven. Mm-hmm. All right. Have we heard of her before? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. so. Jeremiah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Baking he... cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Right, right. So, and of course, where does this all start? In the land of Mesopotamia, Shinar, right? That's where Nimrod established the Tower of Babel was in the land of Shinar. So this woman, she's she's naked, right? She's a very attractive woman. She's young, she, right? And so she's always available. She's she's never gets she never gets pregnant, right? Right. She's uh, but perpetually you know ready to go or whatever. And she's on the back of this creature. Well, she represents lust, and it could be lust for you know whatever your fancy, right? Mm-hmm. It could be heterosexual, homosexual. It could be power. It could be fame. It could be money. It doesn't matter. But she's the thing that you want, and she's on the back of the beast. Now you know. When you ride a, an animal, you kind of think that you're in charge. Unless, of course, that animal is really smart. You know, they say <laughs> that when you're riding an elephant, you think that you're controlling the elephant. Well, only part of the time. You're only controlling it so long as it wants to go there, you know. Mm-hmm. And and when it doesn't want to, then the elephant is deciding where you're going to go. And that's the basic idea here. The woman looks like she's driving, but really it's the beast who's driving. And even more than that, in this cylinder seal, the beast is actually pulling a chariot that is holding Enlil. Okay, I didn't, I didn't forget your question. All right, so, so that's just part of it. This is where we start. Enlil, in, in that and other cylinder seals, we see that he has a crown with ten horns. Right, right. right I mean, you know, you, you can't make this stuff up, right? Somebody already did. We don't have to. And so we start looking at these different symbols. Uh, the the Ushumgal also becomes then the Mushhushu, which is essentially the same creature. Uh, we see this this um, kind of this uh, chimeric creature again. It, it's the same basic thing, a little bit different. Got a longer neck, but we see this on the gates of the uh, of the Ishtar Gate on the walls of the Ishtar Gate, mm-hmm. um, and then. It just becomes the symbol for Nin Urta. And then in one uh, picture, uh, he actually stands up. So this beast then stands up, still has wings. And, and we see that we, we now have more of the, the, the man um, appearances than we do of, of this beast. And what's amazing in Daniel chapter 7, he says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Mm-hmm. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth. And made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. It's like, mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know that's interesting. You know, and, and, and there's so much in the ancient literature that shows you that that the beast is Enlil, but then the beast is also Ninurta, and then there seems to be kind of a a little bit of a division between the two, but they're still very closely tied. 
together. There's this, this syncretism between these two um, that, that's hard to explain, but I think the Bible then gives us some of these other clues uh, to unravel you know, some of these mysteries. So anyway, all of the dragon motifs take us back to Satan uh, or to Enlil, and he has, of course, ten horns on his, on his crown. And, and then there's another word. Uh, which is the word Bashmu. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, and Bashmu just means Bashan. So Bashmu in Akkadian becomes Bashan in Hebrew. And Bashmu just happens to mean snake dragon. And, <laughs> you know, I, if you recall, there was a certain king named Og of the Bashan. Right, right. And, um, and I'll tell you, I, I did research on his name. And uh, his name, Og... Uh, I trace that back to Sumerian, which is Ug, which means death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, we find in the Ugaritic text talking about the Mount Hermon that there was a king of death that abided there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the king of death, right? Ug, <laughs> and uh, his his basic headquarters were in uh, Edre and Ashtoet. Right, and mm-hmm. that's exactly what the Bible says: is that Og lived in Edre and Ashtoreth, and and here you have this sacred mountain or whatever, this place called Her- uh, Hermon. So yeah, <laughs> there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of tentacles to this thing. I mean, it goes out, and you start seeing like, oh my goodness, that's related to that, but no, that's related to that over there, you know. But the symbols that we find in the book of Revelation that seem incredibly mystifying, when we take them back to the ancient Mesopotamian literature, we find that these questions are answered. I mean, they're answered in spades, right? I mean, we we see pictures of where there's a woman riding the beast, and then you see the beast, it, 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 it has this lion form, and then it also has seven heads, and one of them is is dead, um, and they all take us back to Enlil and or Nin Urta, the son of Enlil, who is Lord of the Earth. And again, we have this incredible um, morphing of these two into one. And what's crazy, Derek, is that the Bible says that the beast that was is not and will ascend out of the abyss. Right, right. And that certainly describes these uh, entities that we tend to anthropomorphize. We sort of assume that Satan or these pagan gods from the ancient Mesopotamian realm, whether they're Sumerian or Akkadian or Amorite or Hurrian, are anthropomorphic. We, we're tending to view it from, from very we- through a w- very Western lens. And uh, the Greek uh, and Roman depiction of their gods, and this is not how they were viewed in Mesopotamia at all, which is why... When we see the beast emerge from the sea in Revelation 13, and it's described in very odd terms, it's, okay, it's got a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of... So how can we say it's a dragon? Because that's how dragons were depicted in ancient Mesopotamia. That's exactly how dragons were depicted. And Mm -hmm. everyone in John's day would have known that. It's just we've had our perceptions shaped by Greco-Roman art and religion and, and to some extent... uh, Anglo-Saxon or Scandinavian depictions of uh, these type of beasts. Um, Boy, this is a content-rich book. Again, the the title is uh, Corrupting the Image to Hybrids, Hades, and the Mount Hermon Connection. And I want to focus on Mount Hermon for the last segment here. And I know that we don't want to give everything away because there there is a reveal in this book that uh, I'm citing in my forthcoming book. So just, just waiting for the final you know, edition, Doug, so I can get the page numbers right on my footnotes. <laughs> but yes, I, indeed. I think people are going to be really impressed by this. I, I was, and I am, because I think this is brilliant. There's not been an update to the interpretation of the artifact found on Mount Hermon, and I don't want to give too much away here, uh, but uh, in, in 100 years. And you've come up with something for your new book. But let's focus on Mount Hermon. Uh, Psalm 68, for example, the relevance of Hermon, uh, perhaps we've discussed it in the past. We know that that's where the Watchers descended and made their mutual pact to corrupt humanity through taking human wives and teaching us forbidden knowledge. What relevance does Hermon have for us in the future? Right. Well, so first of all, we have to understand, you know, that the word Hermon 
is uh, from a Semitic root, uh, herem, mean, mean to take an oath or to imprecate oneself. You know, basically, um, I'm going to do this or die trying, kind of, that's the idea. <laughs> and I swear I'm going to do it or die trying. That, that's the basic idea here. So, so hermon is something that's already been set apart for destruction mm-hmm. uh, if you don't fulfill whatever. So, according to the book of Enoch, there were 200 angels that came down and uh, took this oath, right, that we're going to do this thing and we swear we're going to do it. Well, there was an inscription that was found up there, as you well know, by Charles Warren back in 1860-something. And then uh, he took it back to England and it went into the archives of the British Museum. And then um, – so and then – they, the British Museum did a translation, Charles Warren did a translation, and George Nicholsburg all did a translation of that inscription. And I kept, you know, reading about this in, this inscription. I kept, you know, hearing this, you know, something or other is the, is the translation. In other words, uh, according to the command of the, uh, of the great and holy God, those taking an oath proceed from here. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's, pre- that's a pretty impressive inscription, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I'm a little bit of a skeptic at heart, and I, I wanted to see it for myself, you know, because I'm a researcher, and that's what I do. And uh, I'm like, okay, I want to see this thing, right? If this exists, and I believe it does, and, you know, George Nicholsburg is a fantastic scholar. So where is it? You know, let me see this thing. And and as I started looking at it, and, you know, Derek, this is one of those things that you probably experienced many times in your research. Like, this is not what I was setting out to do, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I not, did not anticipate to write a whole chapter on this, a very painful chapter, by the way. I I, I kept digging and digging and digging, and, and I finally put these pieces together. But as I was, I was going through it, I looked at the inscription, and I'm like, wait, it doesn't say and – Holy, which in Greek would be Kai Hagios. I'm like, it just doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait, why would good scholars write that in there? Well, as I looked closer at the text, I discovered that there were words on this inscription that were not in lexicons. And I'm like, oh, that's why they're, they're amending it, because they cannot figure out these two words. And uh, one of them I discovered meant ox, like a bull. Mm Mm-hmm. And that made perfect sense when you look at so many of these epithets of Molech, of Enlil, of Nergal. The the idea of a bull is very, very prominent, Um, which kind of takes us back to uh, Satan in Ezekiel 28. He's a cherub. And what are the cherub? Ah, Uh, How do they look? They have four faces, right? Right. They've got the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion, and the face of a bull. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know what's also interesting in Hebrew? The word for face is not singular, but plural. Panim? Yeah, panim. Okay. It's faces. And I'll tell you, the first time I was exposed to that, I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. How stupid, you know? English is so much better. <laughs> and then, you know, as I, as I kind of contemplated that for a while, I'm like, no, actually, Hebrew's better. Because, you know, I have more than one face, right? I've got my happy face. I've got my sad face. I've got my angry face, you know? And, and our face is constantly changing to be something else. And then, of course, actors are really good at having many different faces, right? And and as I started thinking about this creature, and and I, I don't think I've done, you know, an exhaustive study on, on uh, the faces of, of a cherub by any means, but it's interesting that there are four faces mm-hmm. on the head of this creature. And it can look, you know, so whatever face you're looking at, you're like, oh, this thing's an eagle. Like, oh, no, that's not. Oh, it, it's a lion. Oh, it, it, it's a bull. Oh, it's a man. Mm-hmm. And we see all four of those very clearly. Like in the Anzu bird, it's a hybridization between a lion and an eagle. Right, yes. Right. You with, know? With, a serpent, another, with a serpent's face on it uh, in some depictions. Yes, right. <laughs> right? The serpent being the dragon. Right, right? I yeah. mean, you know, that's that's the crazy thing about this is that we're seeing all of these faces – in these different manifestations of Enlil. And, and so what I discovered is that there's a secret name in the inscription. And it, it came at a real cost. I had to 
I, I spent a lot of midnight oil uh, looking uh, and trying to put all this together. But, you know, it, it finally came together. And well, I was kind of blown away. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think readers will be too when they dig into it and, and see how you uh, followed the detective uh, the clues like a detective and piece this together uh, and we will leave that for people to dig out of the book but it is uh, I, I think it's brilliant and it helps cement research that I've been doing which is why I say and I'm not kidding that it, the, the, you've got several footnotes coming in the forthcoming book because this helps uh, solidify a theory that I've been working on but you know it, we, we see this th- these references to Bashan scattered all through the Bible and uh, and Mount Hermon, and so we should not be surprised when we see things like this com- that uh, turn up archaeological finds that support this uh, th- this idea that Bashan and Hermon are spiritually significant. When we're talking, I mean, how many times, Doug, have you seen Bible commentators or Bible teachers when referencing Psalm twenty two and say, "Well, the bulls of Bashan or the uh, fat cows of Bashan that uh, mm-hmm. was it uh, Amos refers to uh, that uh, it's because that mm-hmm. was cattle property." And actually, that's not true. That's just not right. true. There's a scholar from uh, the Catholic University in Washington D.C. who wrote a brilliant paper called "The Bales of Bashan," who actually mm. cited research into soil samples from Bashan that showed this was a lousy place for raising cattle, that these were <laughs> divine, not bovine, his words. Uh, Robert Miller the third, yeah, he gets credit for that, not me. But uh, this all fits together with this identity that Satan is more than what we've thought. He was uh-huh. not an, invent- an invention of Moses and the Hebrews. He was well mm-hmm. known by other names in other ancient cultures throughout history. And that helps give a little more context to what we read in the Bible and also gives us the sense that, hey, this war is a lot bigger than we thought. Mm-hmm. Boy, it, it, it's so well said. And, I mean, you know, you, you, you uh, found the snake, the geoglyph of the snake, in the land of Bashan, right? And I quote that in my book and well, put the picture in there for well me. again credit too to uh, doug van dorn who's uh one of your uh, neighbors out there in colorado he actually put it in his book giants sons of the gods back in 2013 but we stumbled on it uh, you know inadvertently uh and independently but i want to give him credit for being the first one to go public with this information but uh, yeah if anyone who looks for gilgal Rephaim or rujum el hiri and google earth just look a quarter of a mile north from there Yep. And then when you start yep. looking at it and realize that archaeologists acknowledge, yeah, it's serpent shaped, but it's, you know, probably just lava that cooled in a strange shape. It just happens by coincidence to have about 140 megalithic tombs on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and guess what it happens to look like? It yeah. happens to look like the Bashmu. Exactly. Right? Yes. It looks like the Bashmu, right? So the Bashmu is the serpent, the snake dragon. So, yeah. Right? So and, Bashmu, Bashan. I mean, and then you find a geoglyph that is a Bashan, you know, and I and I was looking at that that geoglyph and I'm like, does that have like little feet at the front of this thing? Because that's exactly what or at least one of the depictions of the of the Bashmu had these, you know, it was a kind of a you serpent know, with little feet at the front. I'm like, wow. I wondered about that, too. But I think when you look more closely, you find out that those are actually just trenches that were dug by the Syrians for tank emplacements in the 1967 oh. war. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> OK, fair. Yeah. Fair at, at both ends, well, there are there are military emplacements that have been abandoned for about 50 years. But uh, OK, what well. what it, what astonishes me, though, about that geoglyph and the fact that it's so connected to the land of Bashan is that nobody knew that Gilgal Rephaim was there until 1967 after the war. I mean, how do you hide something as big as Gilgal Rephaim, which is 500 feet across, way bigger and way older than Stonehenge? And then this three quarter of a mile long, 25 foot high serpent shaped ridge that went undiscovered until 2013. Well, you know, I think Google Earth has changed a lot of things for us that, you know, now any of us can just look down from the heavens and we're like, oh, yeah, I see what that is, you know, and. But again, you know, why would ancient people do this? Like, yes. You know, well, because they're communicating with the gods. Like, that's that's the point. Exactly. And then Hermon is this, this mountain that God, uh, you know, he says really clearly in Psalm 68, a mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. Mm-hmm. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Just substitute Bashmu, right? Mm-hmm. A mountain of God is the mountain of the snake dragon, right? A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of the snake dragon. Right. 
right? And so he says, this is the mountain where God desires to dwell in. Yes, he will live in it forever. You know, and then, I mean, there's a whole other part to this, right? But when you start putting this together with what Jesus did Mm -hmm. when he took the disciples to that mountain. Right, right. Wow. I mean, it's just... Wow. <laughs> well, it's, it's not a coincidence. Again, I'll mention our friend, Dr. Doug, uh, Judd Burton, and uh, I asked him uh, because of his research into the Nephilim and uh, you know what he's doing now. He's got a forthcoming book with uh, Dr. Aaron Judkins on uh, Gobekli Tepe. Why, why does this matter? And he said, well, two words, Caesarea Philippi, which, of course, is the region of Benias or Panias, the Grotto of Pan at the base of Mount Hermon. Jesus specifically chose that location to reveal his identity you know peter said you are the christ the son of the living god he said yep that's it and uh on this rock i will build my church is he standing in front of a nine thousand two hundred foot mountain with the gates of hell which is the cave right over here the grotto of pan will not prevail against it so uh you know it, it's not a coincidence that he chose that location and again that area just to the south of there the uh, serpent mound if we will of bashan and gilgal Rephaim, less than 20 miles away in plain view of mount Hermon. right so it and, all and, fits together right and that's where the that's where the angels came down that's where the inscription is found yeah yeah <laughs> i mean there's there's an incredible uh, you know amount of evidence that shows that that is a very very significant place. Well, this book is a worth just a, a fantastic contribution to our understanding of this spiritual war, Doug. Uh, the book is Corrupting the Image 2, Hybrids, Hades, and the Mount Hermon Connection, due out imminently. Where do people find a copy? So they can go to uh, Amazon.com and just put in uh, Corrupting the Image 2. It's already available for pre-order on Kindle, and I'm hoping to have it out uh, this week is really the goal but, um, so by the time people hear yeah. this, it should be available at Amazon.com. I will be posting a, a review of it soon because uh, this deserves people's attention. Uh, highly footnoted, heavily researched, and wow, content rich. Doug, thanks very much. Thank you. And as of this recording tonight, April 4th, 2021, Doug's new book, Corrupting the Image 2, Hybrids, Hades, the Mount Hermon Connection, Amazon's number one new release in angelology and demonology. And much deserved. And to make it even better, if you like to read on Kindle, if you like to read on an electronic device, the book is part of the Kindle Unlimited program, which means if you subscribe to Amazon's Kindle Unlimited program, you can read it for free. It's like having a virtual library for new books where you can add titles to your library, read them as long as you like, return it when you, your library is full, you want to put something else in. It's a, it's a great program. Sharon and I have taken advantage of it as well. In fact, my new novels, The God Conspiracy and Iron Dragons, both part of the uh, Kindle Unlimited program as well. A link to uh, Corrupting the Image 2 and to Doug's website, uh, Doug's church website, I should say, for the Way Congregation will be in the show notes at vftb.net. More about my novel and some upcoming conferences straight ahead as a view from the bunker continues. Question. How do you fight something? you cannot see. Davian is a third-level master of the order, a small group of men who alone have the power to battle the most fearsome creatures in all of Saramond. For thousands of years, the brothers of the order have protected their world. Now, something has upset the delicate balance of power between man and dragon, and Davian must face what appears to be a dragon that cannot be seen. But Davian is losing his grip on reality, and the fate of the world rests with a stable hand, an underfed priest, and a gardener who's fallen from the stars. Iron Dragons, Book One of the Saramond Quest, by Derek P. Gilbert. New from Rose Avenue Fiction. Shall we begin? Talking the walk from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. You can subscribe to this podcast through a number of different ways. You'll find all of them in the sidebar, one of the sidebars at uh, View from the Bunker, vftb.net. On social media, Twitter, at View from Bunker. My personal Twitter handle is at Derek Gilbert. 
And you'll also find us at Gab and MeWe, Derek P. Gilbert. I can't say enough good about the book, Corrupting the Image 2. Doug has done a really amazing job with the evidence, especially the uh, disclosure, the new discovery on the Mount Hermon stone, which I think is brilliant. We didn't really discuss it in full. We'll leave that for you, dear reader, to dig into the book and take uh, and uh, find that. His connections uh, on that stone, I think, are, are absolutely correct. And it really adds another dimension of understanding to this long supernatural war. And to fully understand the supernatural war that is recorded in the Bible, you need to include everything before Genesis 11, Genesis 12, you know, where, where Abraham shows up. Everything before Abraham is really critical to understanding the rest of the Bible, including end times prophecy. And a lot of churches in America today, a lot of churches around the world, Christian churches just cut off the ends of the Bible because they're weird. And frankly, that's like having a house with no foundation and no roof. There's nothing to anchor the house, and there's nothing to keep the uh, water out and uh, rotting the walls. <laughs> the water in this example would represent bad doctrine. Um, because as I've discussed with the uh, prophecy uh, teacher John Haller in the past, what you believe about end times prophecy really sort of shapes your, your understanding of Christian doctrine, what our role is in the world today. And if you don't have an understanding that there's going to be a, a literal return of Jesus and a restoration of justice on the earth, then you start gravitating toward a, a, a worldview where you believe that it's our role as Christians, our job as Christians, to try to create heaven on earth through our own power, through our own works. And that's not possible. And that leads into all kinds of doctrinal error. But uh, if you understand that there was a literal fall, that there are supernatural intelligences who are evil, who have chosen to rebel against our creator and who want to do us harm, things begin to make a lot more sense. And uh, that's what uh, Genesis 1 through 11 gets you if you totally, if you really absorb that and understand it. And then trying to understand the rest of the Old Testament, especially through the eyes of the Hebrew prophets, because what their neighbors believed about the fallen realm was influenced by the fallen realm. These neighbors, the Moabites, Edomites, Ammonites, etc., etc., weren't just following a bunch of imaginary friends. And that's really at the heart of Doug's new book, of my forthcoming book, and the books that Sharon and I have written together over the last five years. Uh, it's part and parcel of the forthcoming book from uh, Dr. Judd Burton and Dr. Aaron Judkins about Gobekli Tepe. Been waiting for that one for a year. Looking forward to that because that is uh, going to be fascinating as well. So again, check out Corrupting the Image 2. Link in the show notes. Amazon Unlimited. If you subscribe, you've got Kindle. you got a Kindle reader on any of your devices. Subscribe, get it for free or get the hard copy. Uh, it, well worth it because this will be a valuable addition to your research library. Um, so, coming up, we've got uh, some places where we're going to be and uh, able to talk about some of these things. Uh, as of this recording, we are still looking at uh, June as being our next physical conference. And I'm going to bring up the information here while I am doing this on the fly. I thought I had this written down on my uh, little uh, boilerplate uh, closing thing here. Uh, but the uh, our good friends at Prophecy Watchers, uh, Gary Stearman and Bob Ulrich, as of now, still going forward with their uh, 2021, what are they calling it, uh, Future Vision 2021, formerly Future Vision 2020, but it had to be rescheduled, of course. Uh, that is set for June 17th through 20th at the Colorado Springs Marriott. Sharon and I, honored to be among this list of speakers. This is a group of people, well, we, we are honored to have our names included among this group, including Gary Stearman, L.A. Marzulli, Tim Alberino, Bill Salas, Dr. Thomas Ice, Billy Crone. Ken Johnson, Ryan Peterson, Carl Tykrib, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Nathan Jones, Dr. Michael Lake, and more. Uh, don't miss it. You can find out more at uh, prophecywatchers.com. And uh, let's see, Major, that's just two months away. Better start working on our talk. Uh, the Warriors Conference in September from Here the Watchmen. That will be at the Legacy Resort and Hotel and Spa. That is a Christian-owned facility. We're looking forward to uh, another appearance in California 
and uh, bringing the gospel message there. This will be, again, a, an amazing group of speakers, including Colonel David Giamona, co-author of the new book, The Military Guide to Armageddon, Jamie Walden, uh, retired U.S. Marine, Pastor Paul Begley, David Hevener, Joni Stahl, John and Chelsea Jubilee, and, of course, Sharon and me. We look forward to seeing you in San Diego in September, September 16th through 18th. More information and registration online at hearthewatchmen.com. And then in October, the Skywatch TV tour of Israel. As of now, we are still planning on being in the Holy Land in October. It's a uh, couple of weeks as we cross the country from north to south. And uh, this tour will go places that other tours just don't go. A lot of American tour companies don't want to go into what they call, what the world calls, the West Bank. That's Judea and Samaria, especially Samaria. But when you avoid that, you avoid more than half, almost 80% of the history of the Bible. So Joshua's altar, Shiloh, Bethel, uh, Cave of the Patriarchs, if we make it to Hebron this year. Of course, the sites you want to see, like Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, um, baptisms in the Jordan River. We'll spend a day, actually a full day, at the uh, Dead Sea. If you want to relax and float in that uh, salt water there, uh, that's a, a, a one-of-a-kind experience. We'll also see some sites down in the south, in the Negev, that we haven't seen in the, in the past, including uh, Solomon's Mines. So, a lot of stuff to see, and uh, a couple of sites that you don't want to miss. Gilgal, Rephaim, Joshua's Altar, and the Serpent Mound of Bashan. Those are on the tour as well. You can get a complete list of uh, the, the, the costs, a breakdown of the cost, sample itinerary, and more online at skywatchinisrael.com. Com. Coming up, the schedule on this podcast is going to be a little spotty as uh, we're getting ready to launch, Sharon and me, getting ready to launch for Skywatch TV, a new program called The Bible's Greatest Mysteries. And uh, that's going to involve some more pre-production, which means more video editing. So uh, as time allows going forward, we will have more views from the bunker. But uh, I don't know, honestly, that I can keep up a weekly schedule with what we're doing. Uh, because between 5 and 10, the daily news analysis... Uh, and uh, Unraveling Revelation, and now the new uh, Bible's Greatest Mysteries program. That's about two hours of video content a week, and that's a lot to write, produce, and edit in the course of a week, and still try to come up with a uh, a decent program for this uh, program, decent subject material, and give it the attention and the guests the attention they deserve. So uh, just warning you now, uh, just... If you've subscribed to the podcast, every time we post something new, you'll get notice of it. You'll, your podcatcher will download it. But uh, just a heads up, we may not be able to keep up the weekly schedule, especially when we begin to travel. As travel restrictions loosen, uh, we expect to be traveling to some sites with megalithic structures or where strange events in Bible history or strange events in world history as uh, we will tackle a lot of subjects that you normally see only addressed by programs on the History Channel, and usually from a very New Age perspective. So there will be some travel involved, too, which means this podcast may be the uh, the, the, the one straw too many. We'll see how things go, but uh, just giving you a heads up. In the meantime, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to listen, and uh, especially if you take an extra moment to give us a review at uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever else you find us, which is, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our announcer is DC Good, and a view from the bunkers of production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. <laughs>